our resources are shared resources. They need to be treated in a way that is environmentally sound so that they exist in a beautiful way forever. They should be enjoyed by recreational people that want to use it for sport. Uh, and for cultural reasons like that and of course it should be a food source because we're humans and we need to eat and as long as everybody is responsible then that should be fine. Today on Dirty Linen we are sticking with the topic of Port Phillip Bay seafood and I am really delighted to be chatting to Sasha Rust. Uh, Sasha is really the person that clued me into this whole situation so it is perfect to have him on the show. He is a chef, he's also food systems lead at Two Hands which gets beautiful sustainable seafood into the hands of top chefs. Sasha, welcome to Dirty Linen. Hey, Danny. How are you going? I'm good. I'm really good and, you know, really happy to be delving into this topic that you and I have talked a lot about over the past couple of years. I'd love you to start just by introducing yourself. Tell us a bit about, you know, your background, what's got you so interested in seafood and how you've worked in and around it. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, we, we have been talking about this for a little while, so it's good to get stuck in. Um, but I mean, I guess what got me into seafood and, and especially uh, the issues around sustainable seafood and local seafood was my background work with it as, as a chef originally. Um, you know, I had worked in kitchens both in Australia and around the world. And, you know, we're talking, we're working next to professional chefs and people at the top of the game. Um, but you'd start to ask questions about what was happening sort of before the product got to the kitchen. And uh, there was often a lot of blank faces as you looked around, um, just around what was actually happening on the farm, who the farmer was, what was happening in the supply chain, all of those kinds of questions, right? Um, it was all, you know, all, all great technique and quality in the kitchen, but all of that stuff beforehand was a little tricky. Um, and look, I mean, seafood seemed to be the area where there was the most gaps. And as I dug deeper, I realized that there was just layers and layers and layers of complexity, starting from the science of uh, wild fisheries and, and stock health and things like that, to the complexity and the number of hands a product has to go through from uh, the ocean or the fish farm through to actually arriving at the chef's door. Uh, and so I just kind of got, got trapped in it a little bit, to be honest, and uh, I'm still learning learning every day. Uh, it's pretty, pretty fascinating. Tell us about the um, academic work that you've done in this area. Yeah. So, I mean, part of, I guess, um, delving deep was about like, wanting to, I suppose, uh, build a little credibility for myself. So I, I did drop back into into school after leaving uh, my active position as a chef and uh, did a master's focused on environmental sustainability, but really focused around food system sustainability and the you know the the whole chain of the food system. Um, and that got me sort of deep diving into uh, you know the conservation space and the, and the food science space as well from a, from a sustainability perspective. And your work now with Two Hands, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it was it kind of becoming a natural flow on effect of some work that I was doing in the conservation space um, that I just mentioned. I mean, you know, as, as I, you know, part of what we were doing was advising chefs and industry about what and why they should source certain seafood. Um, but one of the biggest challenges with that was actually sourcing the things that we were telling people to try to source. Uh, the supply chain was often the, the challenge there. It was always a breakdown of, of the supply chain and the various hands the product moved through in the supply chain that created a, a sort of a lack of transparency, a lack of tra traceability, um, and all of these sort of really core fundamental issues that people don't really think about because they're not that sexy. Uh, and so the whole point of Two Hands is to really just, uh, you know, we're a startup and we're really just trying to disrupt the way the food supply chains work and reconnect uh, chefs in the food industry back to the source um, by using tools that are out, great digital tools that are out at our disposal now, things like blockchain and, and various things like that. And just, you know, realigning the way that food sort of moves around the place. So what's an example of the way that you work? Yeah. So look, I mean, we, we've, first, the really most important thing is, is finding the, the fishes first uh, and that's finding fishes that are, you know, um, local to the local to the chef they are working in incredible ways they're catching things that are sustainable they're, d they're taking that extra effort and then we work with them to implement traceability systems so that's uh looking at time of catch we play uh, employ uh, methodologies to weigh catch and tag catch and all of that sort of thing at the source and then that data that we're able to capture at the source enters the blockchain we negotiate with supply chain partners to create a direct source of that product to um bypass middlemen and go straight to the end customer so not only do you have a 
uh, a rock solid digital supply chain that can't be messed up due to the fact of uh, due to the way the blockchain works. But you also have this direct connection with a supply chain, and that means the product moves around faster, more direct, more money stays in the hand of the fishes, uh, and all of those flow on effects. So just like put it in terms of a fish that's caught in a particular place and ends up on a plate in front of me in a restaurant. Like what actually happens? Um, look, I mean, it's a lot more simple than it used to be. So, you know, the fisher catches the fish, he tags it, he puts it in a box. It, How does he tag it? Like, wh- where do you put a tag on a fish? It depends on the it depends on the product, and that's that's the trick, right? So, it obviously gets more difficult depending on the product. But uh, if it's a lobster, you can you can tag a ta- a physical tag around the lobster horn. If it's a fish, you can group fish together and put tags into fins or gills. Uh, if they're smaller fish, you often have to go to that bag level where you're sort of tagging a bag that contains species. So there are layers of complexity there but you know once that's done um the product can just enter the supply chain as in enter the van and get basically transferred straight to that restaurant door the difference there that people don't recognize is that's taking potentially two to three hands and transfer points out of the equation and that's where mistakes happen what we've changed is um what was typically you know pencils and and pens on paper that was tagging uh, where fish came from and often just thrown into a box. Uh, and you can imagine a, a wet box full of ice that that tag often gets smudged or wet uh, or just simply destroyed or lost. Uh, we've changed that into a digital system. So there's a lot more, uh, I guess, a lot more rigor and, and, and uh, rock solid sort of traceability in that. And then when I'm the chef in a restaurant, do I like scan with my phone and I can get some information about that fish or that lobster? Yeah, that's right. So it's on that tag. Um, it's, it's currently using a QR code system, which we've all unfortunately gotten very comfortable with over the past couple of years. Um, <laughs> There's positives to that. <laughs> there are positives to that. But that QR code means that all of that data and, and much more, you know, rich content about um, the story of the producer, the history of the producer, the way they fish, their practices, their sustainability credentials, and even imagery and videos and all that stuff can be put in front of the consumer or chef or whoever scans that tag. So really, you know, while we're building technology that is, you know, in some ways you could argue it's separating people, we're also trying to bring that back so that people can still get that extra layer of information. Yeah, love it. So do you find that chefs see the value in this? Are they receptive to it? Oh, of course. Look, I mean, you know, and that goes back to my own own history as a chef. I mean, the thing that we always wanted to know and the story we wanted to tell that tell the customer is where did this product come from? I mean, you don't have to look too far to, to read a menu that talks about farm and provenance. The problem was is that the supply chain didn't always allow that to be 100% true. So now that we can provide that and go further, we can talk about the time that that product, the exact minute that that product was pulled out of the water. Um, it's really, you know, it's, 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 you know, you could argue it's a bit novel, but it also just gives that security and comfort to the chef that, hey, they know their fish came out of the water 18 hours ago um, and they can have that confidence of how long that fish will last, which, you know, a whole fish can last two weeks in a, in a cool room if looked after. But you wouldn't have that confidence in the old way of working. It could have been out of the water a week before you, if you got your hands on it and you wouldn't know. So there's multiple levels there. And, of course, you know, you pull um, you pull people out of the supply chain, you make it more efficient, you return um, better pricing to, to those people that remain in the, in the supply chain. So there's, there's, a, there's a number of benefits there. Sasha, let's talk about local and food because I know that's something that you're really passionate about. Like what are some of the impacts that food being more or less local can have on, yeah, a society? Yeah, look, it is something that I am incredibly passionate about but, you know, the thing, the thing about local is it's often um, – it's very hard to quantify in a very clear way. I mean, pe- people talk about the romance of local and, there, you know, there's certainly cultural value to the romance of local. And we've just talked about, you know, the beauty of a provenance story at the table. But what does that actually mean? Um, and that, that quantifying of that is quite challenging. But, you know, if we talk about sardines as an example of that, and, you know, that's what we're here to talk about, you know, if you remove um, – that local product from a local market, you do first of all damage that prospect of the local industry that wants to showcase that. And that's that cultural level uh, and that romance level. You know, chefs want to showcase the best of what is local to them. That's what they're, they're, you know, they're, they're all hardwired to do that. And you sort of remove that immediately. And that's a huge shame, especially for a city like Victoria or Melbourne, where I live and I work. Um, you know, this is a global food city. To remove that local food source 
has an enormous impact at that at that really sort of you know uh, romantic personal level. But it goes further than that, of course, right? Um, you know, if you remove a local food source uh, from, or you sort of remove that impact to a local ecology, there's really good sides to that. Um, you of course remove the pressure of fishing um, from that local ecology, and that's a good thing, of course, right? But in the case of Port Phillip Bay uh, and this sardine fishery, there was no ecological concern there. It's a tiny fishery. I think it was only about 508 or roughly from my last check, 508 tonne, which might sound like a lot, but in South Australia, the fishery is around 41,000 tonne. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's pretty tiny. So the sustainability issue is never one of them. Um, but what does happen as well is that if you're no longer sourcing from that local food source, you're now sourcing from another food source that may be further away or, no, or almost definitely is further away, right? Uh, and that puts that ecological pressure on another place that's further away. Um, for instance, you know, there are other sardine fisheries in the world that may uh, now have to absorb that pressure. Uh, pressure. Uh, and often, you know, they might be international. There is concern in this particular conversation that uh, people that would have used our local sardine fishery to receive bait will now have to receive uh, bait that's sourced internationally. Uh, and that means sourcing... Uh, bait from uh, often South American fisheries that are heavily fished um, from forage fish stocks that subsistence populations in, in those regions really rely on. So there's a, there's a social layer there as well that I think often people don't, uh, don't really consider. Yeah, it's... It, there's so much in what you've said. Um, and, it, you know, it's that, that romance, I suppose, is that cultural value it is really hard to pin down but i think when we're in a city such as melbourne and as you say you know we love our local food we want to showcase it to people from interstate and overseas uh it just seems it's almost embarrassing to think that there'd be this local resource that we aren't able to share with others when they visit i couldn't agree more um and you know i mean we are we are a globally recognized city for our for our food uh for our food here for our restaurants i mean people come here they expect the best they and when people when diners come to a, a dining destination they expect to eat local right and when we can't provide that it's it's almost crazy right yeah and i mean i've had the good fortune of visiting phil mcadams fishery which is the last remaining sardine fishery in port phillip bay it's such a special place Can, and it just feels like you know when phil stops um on the first of april even if there's licenses that are granted again in the future, it seems unlikely that he would be able to return to in, in the same way to do the same thing. Can you just explain a little bit about the way that he works, the way he operates, and why it might not be so easy just to stop and start something like that? Yeah, look, I, look, I, I can to the best of my knowledge. I mean, you know, he is a he is a sole operator. He's he's intergenerational, sorry, multi generational. I believe he's fourth generation now, and he's looking to pass that on to his 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 kids, um, or was looking to pass that on to his kids. And so there's, you know, that alone is is a huge shame, right? We're talking about disrupting. Um, a really entrenched family business here, uh, and that's um, that's four generations worth of knowledge, right, Danny? And I think people kind of assume that you know fishing is just throwing a net out, um, but what you what you're not really realizing is that's four four generations of how fish behave, uh, and and you know fish are fish are wild creatures. They have certain behaviors. They move around depending on temperature, pressure, you know, time of day, uh, season, all of those things. And so over the years, he's been, uh, and over the years and generations, that's really consolidated into an expertise that has managed to, um, you know, really look after that fishery for, you know, well, like I say, four, four generations. And so if somebody like that, um, who is clearly looking to look after uh, a food source or look after a fishery for their own long-term benefit and their family's long-term benefit, and that, that, that comes with, uh, that comes with responsibility. You know, if you if you have if you feel that responsibility about a fishery, there's a and again an intangible but you know a quite realistic um, sense that they, you're going to look after that. You're going to be responsible in how you handle that, and you're going to want to see that exist. And that has a really um, great environmental uh, outcome. The so removing that means that and replacing it with as you say, which will probably be a competitive process in order to see more licenses return. 
um, that opens up the opportunity for people to come in that maybe don't have that expertise, don't have that attachment to water, and maybe don't have the same interest in protecting it. Um, our waters have been threatened by players like that over the years in the past. Uh, I'm, I don't know if you remember, Danny, but um, there was a bit of super trawler argy uh probably about six, seven, maybe ten years ago, uh, whereby uh, international super trawlers were hoping to, to fish in our offshore waters here in Victoria. Um, and those are the sorts of people that we don't want to see. Obviously, you won't see super trawlers in Port Phillip Bay, but I'm, I'm making a point here. You've followed this issue for a while. You know, from your perspective, how has it got to the point where a sustainable resource that, you know, someone is there fishing for the benefit of Victorians, how has it come to this situation where that licence is taken away? Like, who are the stakeholders? What's happened? (laughs) Uh, that is a that is an insanely complex question. Um, oh, look, there there are so many stakeholders. There's uh, there's there's a there's a there's a layer of politics. So we've got both state. Uh, we've got a state layer of politics there that initiated the the policy and um, that we're now that we're now seeing the, the flow on effect from. We've got fisheries managers uh, that are sort of semi semi government semi semi you know uh, that sort of work work in the industry and science space as well. We've got you know we've obviously got a, a science layer, an NGO layer, a conservationist layer. We've got fishers themselves, and then of course we've got restaurants and 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 the you know the consuming public um the 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 big thing there that i think has been the point of tension is this it's this idea of who owns the resource who is that resource for uh and so there's been a lot of push and pull over you know what what should that waterway at port phillip bay be serving should it be a food source should it be a recreational source for fishers to enjoy and enjoy the the wild of the port phillip bay resource or should it or, or should it not be either should it just be a conservation zone um and now what the answer to that i mean in my mind it should absolutely be all three of those things uh you know it you know our resources are shared resources they need to be treated in a way that is environmentally sound so that they exist in a beautiful way forever they should be enjoyed by recreational people that want to use it for sport uh, and for cultural reasons like that and of course it should be a food source because we're humans and we need to eat and as long as everybody is responsible then that should be fine now what i guess where we find ourselves today is that that has been imbalanced towards um, the stakeholders that you know wanted to protect that as a as a recreational source of of, of joy, uh, and that means that one of uh, one of those elements has had to lose out, and that's you know there's going to be and you, there's going to be multiple opinions on that and which one is right it's hard to know but I, I believe in balance personally. Yeah, I don't really understand why it can't be just like me going to the dog park. And, you know, if there's a cricket game, I'll keep my dog off the oval. And if there's a playground, I'll keep my dog 20 metres away. Um, And if there's a picnic, I will do my best and I might fail sometimes to keep her away from the sausage rolls. I, I don't understand why we can't understand that there are, you know, not even competing interests, but complementary interests. And of course, you know, an ecology like a bay is, a, is, is complex, but we have science to back up the, um, the possibility of sharing the resource. And to me, it just seems so unfortunate that seafood eaters aren't as organized as those who want to go out in a tinny or a charter boat or whatever, or a big fancy boat or stand on a pier with a line and a five-year-old um, to catch fish. Like I just, it just seems, it just seems like it's all got a bit messed up. Look, you're dead right. And unfortunately that, um, you know, I think I think eaters and and seafood enjoyers and, and you know uh, foodies call them that if you like. Uh, unfortunately, are just a, a little bit slow off the mark on, on this particular issue. And frankly, it's not a politically hot space generally. There's not you know uh, foodies don't like to get uh, political, and you know so a lot of these issues uh, they haven't they haven't had their airtime that they that they should have had to really. You know, you can you can walk down the street in Melbourne today, and you know a lot of people probably don't even recognise that seafood comes from Port Phillip Bay, uh, in a commercial sense, um, and that's you know that's crazy. So, what's the best way forward from here, Sasha? I think we've we've you know the legislation, you know, it's well, it's gazetted. It just looks like it's all going to grind into motion. Phil's going to have to move on. What's the best way forward from here? I mean, the ideal the ideal way would be to. Uh, 
but you know, keep keep filling the conversation. Um, keep keep filling the conversation with all the remaining stakeholders. Ensure that the public becomes a more active stakeholder um, in in that conversation. Uh, ideally, we can push to a place in my mind where we do retain a fishery that is uh, sustainable and small scale and environmentally conscious. But that's going to take some work. That's going to take, as I say, uh, the public being a little bit more aware of this issue. Um, you know, uh, you know that I've done and you've done yourself some work, and this this podcast itself is is some work. And in, in order to do that, uh, and chefs, you know, chefs are at the front line of that. Um, and but the great thing that I that I've really enjoyed watching, especially over the last couple of years, is chefs really turning their head to advocacy a little bit more than they have in the past. Um, and some of the things that I described early on in this in in this chat around some blindness to those those former parts of the supply chain are really you know, they really are quickly changing. And I'm seeing, you know, younger chefs, really passionate chefs come in with a real, you know, a real fire in their belly to try and, you know, retain um, exactly, you know, exactly things like we're talking about in a way that is both responsible and future looking and progressive. What do you love to do with sardines, Sasha? How do you like to prepare them? I'm pretty old school on that. Uh, you know, I do it the way that my mum used to do it, which is just slight, lightly floured and, and, and fried and a little bit of squeeze of lemon juice. But, you know, that's it's it's super beautiful. They're, they're, they're raw they're, as long as they're fresh, which, you know, if they're coming from the bay at your front door, they, they absolutely will be. You can't have it. You can't have it better than simple like that. Mm, love it. Um, do you think that Corner Inlet is – a good example of the ways that different interests um, can coexist? Corner Inlet is a really unique story. Uh, and I think, you know, we've spoken elsewhere about this a, f- a few times. It's, it's one of the rare cases where fishermen have looked after their own interests in a way that absolutely considers uh, other stakeholders. And actually, rather than hiding from the limelight, They've been really active in trying to raise their profile and make people be aware. You know, Corner Inlet and, you know, many listening to this probably still don't really know where Corner Inlet is. Uh, And, you know, a couple of years ago, certainly no chefs knew where Corner Inlet was. It's a tiny little bay that just sits behind the Wilson's Promontory here in Victoria. And part of that, uh, part of that, you know, not knowing has been what saved them in the first place from from some of these broad sweeping uh, policy changes that are happening in Victoria. But now it's come to this point where, you know, those fishers have been really active in, in not only um, stewarding their, their waterway in a really progressive way, they, they plant sea grasses to regenerate the, the natural environment. They work with local landholders to ensure that uh, runoff from agriculture is, is well managed. And they are really active in, in changing their own policy and restricting their own policy uh, around fishing uh, uh, fishing restrictions so that they they really do steward in a way that I described earlier that entrenched uh, multi-generational fishers should so that they can pass that on because of all of that that they've got in their back pocket they can stand loud and proud in the public eye in front of chefs and go hey look at us we're doing things look at us buy our product and you look you can look around on a menu pretty much you know at any great restaurant uh in melbourne today and and even now sydney and and elsewhere and you see corner inlet fish and you know i'm hoping that that that's the reason that they stay yeah i mean it is a beautiful story and it's such a lovely place and yeah i've met some really beautiful fishes down there thanks to you sasha but it also does make me think that that multi-generational aspect to it is is so much part of it those people really know those waters and have a feel like they've got a stake in them um as much as you know you know new people can come in uh with passion and with you know with science and knowledge and perhaps experience elsewhere it just feels like again it's just is so sad to lose that those people from the bay, from Port Phillip Bay, that have got that long connection with it, um, it just seems so short-sighted, and it's just very, it's just very frustrating to to let it go. Uh, you couldn't have said it, couldn't have said that better myself, Danny. <laughs> I think we're all, I think we all raise that question from time to time. But you know, we we also need to uh, admit that you know we need to see change in some areas as well. And and this is something that you know I'm obviously at the forefront of at the same time is is going well. You know, yes, where there is where there are issues, we need to do things about those. But not every fishery is a problem. 
Um, not every fishery has a history of bad management and those that don't should be absolutely protected. Yeah. I think that, you know, the first thought that most people have when I say, oh, that we're losing sardines from the bay, they're, they're banning net fishing. I think people hear those words net fishing and think, oh, that sounds a little bit like plundering. That's probably not good. Um, it must be for sustainability reasons. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, I feel like people will have probably read on by the time they you know, get to that, hang on, no, it is sustainable, but people have moved on. They just think, oh, um, yeah, the system must be working in the way it should, but that's not always the case. No, and you're right, and that is an assumption that's made. And, you know, part of the part of the challenge with that is the complexity of, of the way that fisheries operate. Um, you know, net fishing is, uh, an, uh, is a risk. If net fishing isn't handled correctly, it is a problem. Um, organizations like I've worked with in the past are at the forefront of working on removing nets uh, from certain locations uh, that are used in certain ways. But we need to remember that those those are not blanket rules. Uh, the, the, the local environment or the, the global environment has so many aspects to it that need to be considered before you can put a rule across it that says, okay, tick, no net fishing, that is now sustainable. That's just not how it works. In a, in a situation like the sardine fishery that, that we're talking about, you know, that is a highly targeted fishery. Those nets are catching sardines and perhaps some anchovy that are all forage fish that's highly targeted they have put in measures to ensure that there's no catches of any other local wildlife um, as much as is absolutely possible and so you don't see uh you don't see broader issues that you do in in other sort other forms of net fishing like large-scale trawl trawling or net fishing in regions where they are heavily populated with a variety of species and seabirds and seals and dolphins that get caught up in those things those things do happen let's not shy away from that fact but that is not the case here yep sasha is um there anything else that you'd like to say look i i mean it, it's a tr it's a really tricky one i mean i, I think I, i'd like to say a million more things about this but you know unfortunately as you said you know this 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 particular issue is unfortunately a bit put to bed i just wish that uh you know i hope we don't find ourselves in in this area talking about the the next extinction of local food sources yeah well the, we don't have to we don't have to be in that situation. We just have to have the right policies to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so I guess, yeah, people need to be ready to make noise uh, if something, yeah, it, when the next sardine gets taken away from us. But perhaps we can also make some noise to get sardines back on our plates. <laughs> perhaps we can. And, look, I mean, it goes back to the old adage of, you know, know where your food comes from, ask the questions. And a part of the work that, you know, I do with Two Hands Now is to make that job easier because, frankly, it has been hard in the past. But, you know, we all we all should know what we're putting in our bodies. It's pretty simple. You know, we have to do it every day. You should probably know a little bit about it. Love it, Sasha. It's been so good to have you on. Love your expertise and passion and generosity in sharing it. Thank you so much for being part of this series on Port Phillip Bay. Absolute pleasure, Danny. Speak to you soon. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production.